Good evening and welcome to a series of critical conversations that we are having on Scroll in partnership with Survivors Against TB and Pi. My name is Chapal Mehra. I'm a writer and a public health specialist. And today we are going to be understanding the economic impact of COVID-19. But before we begin this discussion, let me give you some background. We all know that COVID-19 has brought the Indian economy and the global economy to a grinding halt with the national and state level lockdowns and an already slowing economy, jobs, production, sale and consumption of services, everything except essential goods have been affected. What is the future of this stalled post pandemic economy? What is the scenario for jobs? And what actions are needed by the government to address some of the economic and growth needs of a very uh, economically diverse and often unequal population in India. While our discussions are largely dominated uh, about around COVID-19 and the lockdown is slowly being lifted, this discussion becomes really critical because this possibly poses a greater challenge to us than even COVID-19 because uh, people are losing jobs both in the formal and the informal economy, and families and communities are bound to suffer during this time of crisis. So how do we start unwrapping and uh, understanding this multi-layered and difficult question? Let me introduce today our speaker, uh, who is probably one of the finest uh, economic thinkers uh, of our times. He's also uh, someone who has extensive experience not just working with um, governments and with civil society, but also with people on the grassroots. So thank you so much, Nordres, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. So before we start, let me let me lay down a few uh, um, uh, sort of hygiene points for our viewers. Uh, I'm going to be asking Jean a series of questions, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do comment on our Facebook, on our Twitter, or on our Instagram, and we will try and bring all of those to Jean so that he can address some of those questions that you have around the economics of this pandemic, but also the impact that it is having on communities and on people. So Jean, let me ask you a sort of very broad question. Uh, we all knew that India's economy and consumption were sort of already slowing uh, before the pandemic hit us. Um, now, COVID-19 is bringing us uh, devastations that we've not seen in a long time. We're told our rate of growth is actually lower than it was in the 70s. Can you sort of uh, introduce us broadly to some of the key areas of impact for the formal and for the informal economy? I mean, where are we headed right now? And how are we going to be, uh, how should we be understanding this? Okay, that's a lot of questions to start with. Uh, I don't think we need a PhD in economics to understand that there was a crash of the economy during the lockdown. Uh, according to the official estimates, the GDP declined by 23.9% in the first quarter of this financial year. That's April, May, June, which coincides more or less with the period of the national lockdown, although June was coming out of the lockdown. But quite likely, the contraction was more than that. And I, frankly, I don't think we should pay so much attention in any case to these quarterly GDP growth estimates because they're not very reliable at all at the best of times. And this year, there was a lot of guesswork that's in fact explicit in the press release of the National, National Statistical Organization that contains these estimates where it's explained in so many words that the data collection required to produce these quarterly estimates was uh, very incomplete in that period. So there was a lot of guesswork, more guesswork than usual. And you can imagine that the, statistici the statisticians must have uh, leaned on the side of optimism at every step because that's what they are expected to do by the government. So the, con the actual contraction is likely, likely to have been more. Uh, just to illustrate the point, I mean, suppose we are very optimistic and that we say that in April, the level of, when the whole country was more or less shut down, uh, nevertheless, the level of economic activity was around 50%, and then maybe 70% in May and 90% very optimistically in June. That would average to 
70% level of economic activity and therefore a decline of 30%, which is much more, much more than the official estimate. So you can see that actually uh, that estimate is probably not only unreliable, but an underestimate. So I think it's better to focus data of a more re reliable kind that we actually have because, because there's a lot of it if we are actually concerned with, with what's happening to people and their incomes and earnings and employment, which is ultimately uh, why we're in GDP in the first place. Uh, and as it happens, there have been many household surveys during that period, in fact, perhaps more than at any other time earlier. Uh, many of these surveys had various limitations, like many were telephonic surveys. Uh, nevertheless, we learn a lot from them. For example, there is a survey of urban workers uh, done by the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics, which shows that uh, half of the urban workers in the months of April and May in the lockdown did not earn anything, more or less what you would expect. And the average decline in earnings was about 80% for the migrant workers, which again corresponds to what you would expect. Uh, similarly, there's a large scale survey, even larger, about 25,000 respondents by the CSDS in collaboration with Gaon Connection, which found that 78% of poor people found it difficult to feed their families during the lockdown. There are many other surveys of that kind. So I think we have a fair idea of the disruption that happened in that particular period. Uh, what we don't, I'm sorry, the lights went off, but I'll continue speaking. Uh, what we don't know so well is what happened after the month of June because there's not much data on what happened uh, since and therefore we don't really know to what extent the economy is reviving today and you ask me what is going to happen next I'm afraid that's always a very difficult question to answer uh, in economics but I think one can say with some confidence that it's going to be very difficult because now there are so many adverse factors that compound each other uh, there is no purchasing power in the economy, there's a crisis in the banking system, there's a fiscal crisis, there's a crisis of expectations with business not expecting things to pick up so soon. The world economy is in crisis and therefore export demand is not going to be so high. So there are multiple obstacles that are going to be quite difficult to overcome and I do think it's going to take time. It's not going to be like some uh, government advisors claim that we're going to have a v-shaped recovery like a you know like a rubber band that bounces back i think that's really over optimistic it's going to take time and meanwhile people are going to be to have a very hard time and i think that is what we must focus on first and foremost how to help people as is and in the same uh, way uh, at the same time uh, help the economy to revive i mean the, this is a pretty grim scenario that you have outlined and uh, a fair bit of uncertainty that stares um, literally billions of people in the face, uh, particularly in India, because a large section of our population uh, it feeds itself and lives off the informal economy. Um, now, you spoke of migrant workers and, you know, uh, when our migrant workers, when the lockdown was initiated, we see we saw the most horrifying images, um, you know, um, not just on our television screens, but everywhere in newspapers and um, on the internet, reminding us how unequal and how vulnerable this population was, because these are the people who build the economy. These are the building blocks. It is their switch that builds up these big towers in which fancy, offices work and uh, we realized that we are not really going to be able to we, we were not prepared to take care of our working class population at all you know this is the base of the uh, economy and and uh, we didn't even transport to go back forget about handouts so uh it, it impacted people physically it impacted people mentally and emotionally some people even died now where do you think we could have done better because this is something that while we claim so much bravado uh, as a growing economy, if the most, the most, the largest part of our population was so vulnerable, uh, what should we have done better? Uh, Chapal, I think you are right that a great injustice was done to migrant workers in this lockdown. Uh, 
uh, not just to migrant workers, to all workers for that matter, but especially, of course, to migrant workers. And in that respect, the lockdown was a little bit like demonetization, because in both cases, uh, very little attention was paid to the consequences for poor people. In a sense, demonetization was worse because demonetization was just plain stupid in any case. So it was inflicting misery for no purpose. Uh, in the case of the lockdown, at least you can make some argument that some sort of lockdown was perhaps uh, necessary. But I think the lockdown was really very harsh and especially so, of course, for migrant workers. In fact, if you remember, the trains were all canceled just before the lockdown. So it's not even, you know, sometimes people say we were given four hours notice, but the migrant workers were not even given four hours notice. The trains were canceled before the lockdowns and then they were marooned thousands of kilometers from their homes without a job, without a shelter, sometimes without food and without any sort of assistance. So that's really an extreme case of not paying attention. Now, in retrospect, I think one could have avoided this. Of course, it's always easy to be wise after the event. But remember, two months elapsed between the first case of coronavirus in India and the lockdown. So there was some time to think. And it seems to me, in retrospect, that the migrant workers, you know, some sort of uh, subsistence allowance could have been arranged for them so that they can decide whether to stay in place or whether to go back home with some assistance. And with a modest uh, uh, subsistence allowance, I think that many of them might have preferred to stay where they were and then they could have stayed there and the economy would have revived more easily later on instead of them being marooned for weeks and then going back in the most awful conditions to villages where there's nothing for them to do, no employment. And then now them having, having to go back again, having spent all their money to places where they're not sure where they're going to get a job and where they fear that local lockdowns may be imposed again. So I think there would have been, a, there were options, there were possibilities of doing much better, giving them uh, allowances, making shelters available to them, uh, community kitchens, and if necessary, transport them back home in a dignified and safe manner. Uh, so I think this is just one symptom of the general attention to the consequences of these policies for poor people. And for that matter, that's a chronic problem in economic policy in India. I think overall, not just during crisis, like demonetization and the lockdown, we pay too little attention to these people because they are powerless they don't have a voice, they just get a vote every five years and the rest of the time they're just expected to keep quiet. Uh, so I think that was a very clear case of uh, dramatic uh, failure to have an enlightened social policy. I'm, I mean, this is the dramatic failure of the state, but also to my mind, uh, uh, a dramatic failure of uh, uh, our own uh, society in a sense, you know? Yes, um, because I agree. We, we I haven't agree. I agree. We haven't been able to uh, reach out and support this, or even question it, for that matter. You know, um, the one of the things that uh, people who and, are concerned, and, and also, and if I can add to that, Chapal, I think it's also uh, sobering to see how few people have opened their doors to these yeah. migrants who are struggling to go home. Some of them yeah. have. Let's be fair; there have been people who have been very generous, who have gone out of their way, including poor people who shared whatever little they had to help the migrant workers. But uh, many of them have struggled to go back, facing a certain amount of hostility. In fact, I was shocked uh, when I heard from a returning migrant uh, in Latihar in Jharkhand that one reason why so many migrants came back following railway tracks and rivers is that they were scared of going through villages because of the hostility that they might face from the local population. So this is quite a disturbing and I think it tells us something uncomfortable about the social divisions and in Indian society and the manner in which solidarity, it's not that it doesn't exist, there is solidarity, but it tends to be confined to one's, one's own community and not to extend mm -hmm. across the barriers of caste and community and so on. So I think this is something that we need to think about. Um, let me uh, let me also remind our viewers that we are taking questions. So if any of you have any questions for Jean, uh, we will bring them up. If you have any questions that you want to ask Jean, please ask us. In English, in Hindi, in Hindi, there is no difference.
वी विल ट्राई एंड एड्रेस देम किसी भी तरह uh, उनसे पूछेंगे लेट मी आस्क यू आई एम सॉरी टू कीप कीप एडिंग बट द रीजन आई मेंशन दिस ऑप्शन ऑफ अ सब्सिस्टेंस अलाउंस इज दैट इट वुड हैव बीन वेरी चीप आई मीन इफ यू हैड टू अरेंज अ सब्सिस्टेंस अलाउंस ऑफ 3000 rupees per person per month for the migrant workers which is not a lot but it's it would have enabled them to survive and to stay in place without hardship uh, for 20 million migrant workers it would have cost 12000 crores i mean this is nothing but it would have required preparation and planning and also so of coordination at the national level because obviously or not not really obviously but unfortunately the state governments have been very reluctant to do anything for the migrant workers from or the state so they could not put in place a system at the national level so that the state governments are enabled to pay subsistence subsistence allowance to the migrant workers who prefer to stay in place and wait for things to improve rather than to rush back home in the most difficult conditions and I'm, i'm going to just uh, because the connection was not so great uh, i'm going to just rephrase uh, 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 and Uh, what uh, jean was saying he was saying a, subsist- a subsistence allowance for of let's say 3000 rupees uh, for a, a migrant worker or a migrant worker family per month would have been actually cheap both in terms of uh, uh, saving lives but also i think uh, if i may add giving them dignity security and reducing economic anxiety uh, that they face uh, uh, today post the lockdown and a slowing economy um and i think this is an actually an important policy perspective and uh, intervention that can still take place because the the uh, unemployment rates remain very high i mean leading to that question jean let me ask you what do you think are the key sectors that are getting affected because everybody's talking about banks and you know lowering consumption but there's farming there's informal sector employment there are people who we see all the time in our cities who uh move from i mean who are migrant workers there are hawkers what is the impact because they live on daily work right you set up a uh, set up something and you get paid daily and you buy rations daily and you feed yourselves and you save a little bit that remains uh for 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 a difficult time now they haven't had an income for over 6 months what is the impact of that so uh, i think you are i'm sorry your voice is breaking from time to time but i think i think you asked about the sectoral composition of the economic impact uh if you look at the sectoral gdp estimates for what they are worth from the that same press note that i mentioned earlier what emerges is that farming continued more or less at a normal level as well as uh, certain essential utilities like electricity water and so on maybe certain kinds of communication uh, and then what is called professional services although i think there's an element of illusion there for example think of, think about schooling i mean the during the lockdown there was no schooling the school closed but the teachers continued to be paid so in terms of gdp accounting that sector was just on track uh, so barring these few sectors and to a certain extent mining and uh, certain parts of the formal sector where for example people can work for, for, from home I mean, barring these it was basically a nation across the board and uh, especially of course the large informal sector which employs about 90% of the workers and uh, there's also evidence that the poorer workers were hit more uh, i mentioned earlier the survey of urban workers by the center for economic performance at the london school of economics so they found an average decline in earnings of urban workers of 5% during the lockdown but it was much more for the poorer workers so the inequality even among the urban workers for, for, forget about between the workers and the privileged classes and the capitalists and so on but even among urban workers it was a large increase in inequality to the extent that the, the top 25% of urban workers were earning 84% of the total income of urban workers during the lockdown leaving only 16% for the remaining 75% so huge 
inequality, which leaves the poorest uh, really with very little. Uh, and then, of course, there are entire occupations that have been decimated during the lockdown and that continue to find it uh, very difficult to do in anything that involves a risk of infection uh, or anything, for example, something that has been shut down, like the, let's say, the railways. The railways are still pretty much non-functional and therefore those who were hawking the railway stations and so on, uh, they are still not able to, con to continue their normal occupations. That I can see that the snack vendors in the streets are having a very hard time because most people are afraid of uh, buying snacks. Even I'm, I have stopped buying snacks in the street because I'm not sure whether it's safe. Uh, then there are sex workers and all kinds of other people, you know, people who work for marriage bands who are still in a state today where their normal occupations cannot be continued. And so what, because obviously they have to do something. I mean, they, their savings are unlikely to last very long in most cases. Sometimes they borrow or they sell some assets. But uh, what they also do is they look for some kind of fallback occupation like street vending. I mean, street vending, uh, like selling eggs, for example, you can see now a lot of people are selling eggs because eggs is still something that people are not afraid of buying. Uh, so that gives you some sort of m minor income, but that doesn't really add anything to production in the economy. That just means a redistribution of income among the vendors because the purchasing power is what it is. It's very limited at the moment. So there's a kind of redistribution of income between the vendors, but no increase in the total income of the vendors. So it's a kind of very defective form of fallback occupation. So I, I think that a lot more has to be done to support the informal workers. If you ask me, what has the central government done so far to help these people? It's very little, it's basically three things. The doubling of food rations and the, the public distribution system, an extra 40,000 crores for the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which I think was a welcome, welcome step, even if it may not be enough in the end. to the Jandan Yojna. So at best, something like one lakh crore spent on the 90% of informal workers uh, who are uh, struggling now to survive. That is grossly inadequate. And it's not even a good policy from the point of view of reviving economic growth, because at, at, as long as the purchasing power is diminished, uh, it's going to be very difficult for business, businesses to revive. So I think both on the grounds of humanitarianism and on the grounds of reviving growth, the government needs to be to do a lot more to regenerate its purchasing power and to put money into poor people's hands. I think this is this is possibly one of the most succinct uh, uh, elaborations I've heard of what we can do because uh, there's a great deal of fatigue around. Uh, these stories uh, and, and these lived experiences of uh, uh, deprivation and inequality. And I think it's really important to see these uh, some of these suggestions as policy inputs that can actually be implemented. I don't know if they ever will be, uh, because a lot of people feel that the government uh, 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 needs to do a reset in how it approaches uh, economic development uh, right now. And, and, you know, think about uh, what economic development should look like post this uh, pandemic. And actually related to that, we have a few questions. Aman Kaushik uh, is asking this question, and I think it's a broad question, but it's something that you've uh, touched upon. So if you could briefly answer this, how can this economic bump be used um, to reset our economic systems to a circular model? Um, I think what he means by a circular model is a slightly more redistributive, equal, and perhaps just model. Um, any thoughts on this, Sean? Well, I am not very optimistic that this crisis is going to be used constructively as an opportunity to bring about better economic policies. But of course, we can think about it. And since you have interpreted the word circular in a helpful manner of bringing more equity and justice, I think it's certainly something that we should think about a lot more. Because not only has the government done too little to help the poor, it has also done too little, in fact, virtually nothing to 
uh, uh, the privileged classes to contribute. They should have, they should be contributing. This is a national crisis where a large part of the population is literally struggling to survive. So naturally, the privileged classes should contribute, and they have virtually been asked for nothing. I mean, uh, we could think now uh, of uh, things like a wealth tax, for example. I mean. <laughs> The richest people in India are so rich that we don't, we are just not able to imagine it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there are about one billionaires in India. Dollar billionaires means that you have a wealth of about 8,000 crores. Now, why, why would anyone have 8,000 crores? I just don't get it. What are you supposed to do with that? And some of them have much more than 8,000 crores. Now, these 100 people between them have a wealth of about uh, I think 50 lakh crores, it's astronomical. Why can't we ask them on a one-off basis to give, let's say, 5% of their wealth, but still keep 95%, like, you know, more than 7,500 crores, so that we can do something to help the people, people who are struggling to survive. Uh, but we're not even talking about this. Uh, even the public sector employees, for that matter, I know that I, some of my friends might uh, disown me if I say that, but look, the state governments are facing an even worse crisis than the central, much worse crisis than the state central government, because unfortunately the GST has taken away most of their tax powers. Uh, the ta their tax revenue has crashed. Uh, they are now in a terrible financial crisis, and they are therefore unable to do much on their own uh, to help distressed people. But uh, one thing they can do if they want is to uh, ask for a contribution from the public sector employees at least, or at least from the better off among the public sector employees who have now had a paid holiday, most of them, for the last six months. So I think that uh, it's absolutely right to say that this is a time when we should think about equity measures and ask the rich people to contribute more and uh, not just during the lockdown, but hopefully beyond that as well. A new distrib redistributive model uh, of, uh, uh, of income and taxation, in a sense, is what you're pointing towards. An idea that uh, a lot of the upper classes in India might find uh, uh, scary, but uh, um, uh, in the long term, it might be what uh, the country actually needs, because uh, the largest section of this country's population is still poor and still working in informal employment. Uh, we should not forget that. Um, another question that has come to us from Tosif Siddiqui is about how independent, both politically and financially, are state governments in implementing policies for helping poor and underprivileged people, while central government bluntly is ignoring them at the moment. I think this is the chicken and egg situation, especially after the GST isn't it? Because we keep saying, oh, state government should do something, but where will state government get the money from? I mean, what, what is your view on this, Sean? Well, I think I've already answered that to some extent. I think it's absolutely right that the uh, state governments are facing a huge fiscal crisis at the moment, made all the worse by the fact that the central government is refusing to pay its GST dues. So there's not a lot that the state, state governments can do on their own. Uh, to get out of that, and that's why it's so important for the central government uh, to do more to help them. I just find it incomprehensible that the central government can be so hostile to the state governments. And I mentioned that one of the few things uh, that they can do, and they can do some things to raise revenues on their own, would be to ask the better off among the public sector employees to contribute, because the salaries of public sector employees is a huge part of the state budgets. In many states, it's about one third of the total budget. I'm not saying you should take a big chunk of it, but even a small chunk of it will make a big difference. For example, in Jharkhand today, the government is struggling to put 200 crores together to give food rations to those who don't, who, who, to poor people, in fact, to the poorest people who don't have a ration card, trying to cars to 15 lakh people at its own cost and struggling to find the money for it. And meanwhile, the uh, salaries of public sector employees in Jharkhand take about 20 to 25,000 crores per year. So even a fraction of that, even 1% of that, uh, would help the state governments to have some margin of action to help poor people. 
Uh, the central government can do a lot more, of course, uh, not only the kinds of taxes that it might, uh, you know, it can borrow. Pre I think we have, yeah, I'm sorry, we lost yeah. you for a little bit, Jean, but let me just say this, that I think Jean was talking about what the state governments could do and what the central governments could do, and also in particular, uh, how uh, people who are already privileged in a sense have stable economic uh, situations can contribute to providing some support to coming out of this crisis, especially for people who are, uh, <coughs> in economically vulnerable situations. John, let me turn to another question that we often talk about and we don't seem to stress enough on. We've already uh, always celebrated our demographics, right? We're a young country. And in fact, when I was doing these discussions with a lot of public health folks, they were like, India will have a better survival rate because we are a young population. But the truth is that there are thousands and lakhs of people coming out of schools and colleges whose education and employment is now looking deeply uncertain, right? Uh, how are these folks supposed to deal with this? And what do you think will be the social impact of this? I'm asking you this because you've done a lot of work on education and health. But I mean, for, for a moment to imagine a scenario that there are going to be generations that are not going to have uh, the possibility of employment, what, what are we looking at? So uh, your voice is also breaking a little bit, but I heard you asking about the uh, the kinds of uh, social consequences of unemployment. Uh, it's yeah. hard to tell, of course, and we don't really have much information on what's going on, but we can certainly think of certain possibilities. Uh, one is that people will start looking for a scapegoat or scapegoats or be made to look for scapegoats which is a common pattern in situations of mass unemployment. Uh, that is how uh, the Germans in the 1930s during the Great Depression were made to look for scapegoats among the Jews. And unfortunately, how today uh, some people are being told that uh, it's all the fault of the Muslims and that they are the ones who are bringing infection and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know if you remember the case of a man called Regal in Rajasthan, uh, who in 2016, or maybe it was early 2017, uh, had hacked to death a Muslim person on camera. Uh, he was a person who had lost his job. He was a kind of small time marble trader and he lost yeah. his business. He went back and after that he sat at home and look at, looked at all kinds of incendiary videos, anti-Muslims and so on, and then he ended up killing this person who was completely innocent. Somebody didn't even know. Uh, so these are alarm bells. I mean, these are, these are the kind of thing, uh, as you know, that could happen on a much larger scale today because of the nature of the media and the disinformation system. So this is one of the kinds of social consequences that one could see. Uh, one could also see mental health issues. I mean, one of the insights from the surveys I mentioned earlier about what happened during the lockdown is that many people were under mental stress. You know, they had anxiety, depression. Uh, one survey in Delhi found that uh, half of the respondents had problems sleeping at night because of anxiety. So that's another kind of consequence that one could see. And then a third consequence, a third possible consequence is a further reduction in the labor force participation of women, which is already very low in India, one of the lowest in the world, except for some parts of West Asia, and unfortunately declining uh, in recent years. Uh, this is a big loss in many ways. Uh, it's a loss of freedom for women, it's a loss for the economy, and it puts women in a situation of dependence on men that creates all kinds of gender inequalities. So I think it would be very unfortunate if the labor force participation of women were to decline further because of the mass unemployment that we are likely to see in the near future. I mean, uh, this again is, uh, I think, a, a possibility. Uh, uh, the possibilities that you are identifying are, again, chilling because you're talking of social uh, dissonance and unrest. You're talking of uh, uh, mental health issues. Uh, you're talking of... 
gender parity. Yeah. I mean, the, as possibilities, these are scary, just as possibilities, <laughs> these are scary. Yeah, yeah. Because we've only been inching towards some of these goals very slowly. Um, even in our development model, uh, these have not been our primary goals in any case. Um, you and Amartya have done a lot of work around education, health. I want to focus a little bit uh, uh, on these issues and also on nutrition because uh, across the board, we are hearing stories about how people cannot get enough to eat. A large uh, a number of these people are very often are women and children. Um, the government says that it has doubled its rations, but is it really enough? And what constitutes good nutrition is something that we, we don't seem to be discussing at all, because all we are concerned about is that if you got enough to eat and what is that enough is that good nutrition because to good nutrition is linked cognitive abilities and learning abilities and the uh, ability to learn skills and all of this is linked to economic growth and development something that we worship rather arduously um, in in our public narrative so what do you think uh, if we do not do effective work on nutrition at this point uh, or for that matter, uh, invest in education uh, and health. What do you think is the likely uh, likely outcome? Because we know that, uh, for instance, catastrophic health costs are the single biggest reason for people to be pushed back into poverty, right? But okay. uh, that's a lot of questions. Uh, but I'm glad you mentioned children because very there's been very little attention to children uh, in this crisis. I mentioned earlier that. It's a general feature of public policy in India that very little attention is paid to, to poor people. And that applies even more to children because children are twice removed from the centers of power. They belong to poor households who are marginalized in the first place. And on top of that, they don't have a voice within the family. Uh, and that's one reason why during this lockdown, when one of the most important things uh, perhaps was to protect children from adverse uh, effects on their well-being and their future, uh, very little discussion has taken place on that. And in particular, as you know, uh, the school meals and the Anganodi services uh, were, were discontinued without batting an eyelid in many states for a long time, and in some states they still have not resumed. Uh, I think that's a, a matter of concern. Uh, the food rations you mentioned, you said, are they enough? I think that the, the, the double food rations uh, for those who have them, are enough to avoid hunger and to fulfill maybe your calorie norms, but not to be well nourished. So you are right to say that it's not enough. And we have to remember, of course, also very importantly, that 500 million people in India are outside the cover of the public distribution system, including many poor people. And I think there the most important concern is for uh, landless workers, especially in places like Bihar, where there are huge numbers of them uh, who are uh, living from hand to mouth at the, be at the best of times. So if they don't have a ration card right now, they're really in a very critical position. So I, th I think it's extremely important to extend the coverage of the public dis distribution system to include them. And it's really inexplicable how the central government is refusing to release more of its excess food stocks for this purpose. Uh, several state governments, including Jharkhand, Rajasthan, and I think also Bihar, have been asking for small amounts of additional food stocks so that they can universalize the PDS in rural areas, and the central government has refused. So I think there's still a lot of work to do on that, and then we should definitely revive the uh, midday meals in all the schools, and uh, to the extent possible, uh, the uh, Anganwadi services, uh, certainly the critical Anganwadi services as well. And I would even say uh, more than the medium in the schools. You mentioned schooling. I think a lot of damage is being done to children, not only their health and nutrition, but also their education. I mean, a poor child who, as it is, has difficulties learning and, ke and keeping up with the curriculum. If they're out of school for six months, you can be sure that firstly, they may or may not come back. And secondly, they are likely to to forget a lot of what they had done earlier. So I'm not saying that we can reopen the schools overnight, uh, but I do feel that we have to start resuming at least some schooling activities, even if it means 
taking the children and of course having also other safeguards so that the children at least retain some connection with the school and the habit of going to school. Uh, because the longer the schools are closed, the harder it will be after that uh, to uh, put them back into shape and to bring the children back and to uh, enable them to catch up with the loss. So there's a lot to do. Uh, you had mentioned my work with uh, Amartya Sen, uh, it is, uh, of course, to a large extent about these issues of school, uh, of uh, nutrition and health and so on. The basic point we have been making over and over again in the last more than 40 years, uh, starting with our book, Hunger in Public Action in 1989, is that in all these fields, and in, for that matter, in many other fields that are important for the quality of life, uh, you are not very well served at all by leaving things to the market and you have to do something through some form of public action, uh, not necessarily government action, it could be government action or it could be uh, non-government, non-profit action, which is also very important in those fields, but you basically can't leave things uh, to themselves. And I think in the last 40 years, we have found uh, more and more evidence of uh, the validity of this point, that if we want to see results, we want people to be better nourished and healthier and better educated, and uh, we want their well-being to improve generally, then we can't just wait for economic growth to do it. We have to take all kinds of uh, public measures for it. And I think the lockdown was a very important rem reminder of that as well, because the states that, that were better prepared and had better health system in the first place have coped with this much better than others. Oh, sorry. I was speaking in my mic was muted. Uh, thank you for helping us understand many of these layered issues, but also thank you for bringing about uh, uh, mentioning the excess food stocks. That was something that you were the first to talk about, and we still haven't seen any action on that yes. because India has We've excess some. food We've stocks. Some, but not enough. Not enough. Yeah. But, I mean, we've, we've had six months of a virtual lockdown and we've had excess food stocks, nobody should have got hungry uh, is, is the critical point that I want to underscore, that we, are, we, we may not have uh, a lot of uh, cash lying around in that sense, a lot of resources, but we do have food. And uh, in a sense, no Indian should be hungry at this point, at least should not have been in the first few months. Um, we've got a ton of questions and we've got just 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask you because I think a lot of viewers want to know your views on several things. Um, I think one of the things that uh, uh, that has been asked is, is there both social and political negligence uh, at work and reducing wealth disparity by implementing uh, inheritance, ta inheritance tax or wealth tax attacks on the super rich or is it just political can state governments implement this i think this is a this really basically goes back to what you were mentioning earlier is this political and social negligence at work uh, in your view Jean, very briefly well i think it's mainly a problem of resistance from the privileged i mean obviously if you were to impose even a small wealth tax you can be sure that there would be a huge reaction from those who are starting to lose. But, uh, you know, we should at least talk about it and uh, we should find ways uh, because that could make a, make things uh, a lot easier. I don't think that can be done by the state government. It will have to be done by the central government. But uh, it's uh, symptomatic that until recently there was not even any discussion of this. I mean, that's the way uh, the propaganda system uh, prevents us from thinking uh, of things that uh, could actually make a big difference but would be inconvenient for those in positions of power and influence so i do think there are things we can do uh, wealth tax even if you don't go for a wealth tax you could have something perhaps a little easier which is an income tax surcharge for this year or maybe on last year's uh, income and that will that will be very fair because it would mean that those who have continued to have high incomes and perhaps even higher incomes during the lockdown and who have done well during that period will contribute more. So I think that would be a very fair and very simple thing to do. I mean, there's nothing easier than to impose a ta an income tax surcharge. Uh, so again, that, that would not, it doesn't have to be very large. I mean, uh, but even a small surcharge could really ease uh, the resources that are available. So I think it's uh, 
It's a question of overcoming that resistance, and that is not just a matter of political will from the government, but it's also a responsibility of the society as a whole to ask the privilege to uh, share and to help those who are in distress. I, I, we have a slightly tricky question also, Jean, uh, by Hitasham Khan, who says, what are your views on the PM Cares Fund? Um, and I think that rises from your question about public sector employees contributing because he's saying many employees, both from government and private sector, have been forced to pay the PM Cares Fund by means of a salary cut, while companies are donating in PM Cares. Um, but they're really cutting the salaries of middle-level employees. Yes. Mm, very briefly, Jean, if you could touch upon that. Well, uh, I haven't really studied the PMKS fund, but uh, you know, from what I know, it's pretty shocking in many ways. I mean, first of all, the name is outrageous. PMKS, as if only one person cared in the country. And of course, it has to be the PM. So even in this moment of crisis, when people are suffering, uh, somehow the system, the government, the PM, think only about promoting the person at the top. I mean, that's very unfortunate. And then the refusal to disclose uh, the details of the fund, you know, uh, refused, refusal in particular to entertain applications and applications under the RTI Act, that's also very shocking. And then, uh, as you mentioned, the way many people and also many uh, companies and public sector companies in particular have been put under pressure to contribute to the fund. I mean, all this, uh, I feel is quite unacceptable. And I don't think this is really the best way to do something. I, I think if the government were to pay its GST dues to the states, or at least try to arrive at a fair deal with them, that would be infinitely better than this non-transparent uh, authoritarian fund, which is used for whatever uh, we know. Um, uh, the other question, uh, uh, thank you for saying this, Sean. Uh, the other question that has come from Paul Mukherjee is about a recent article in the BMJ quoting um, that public health officials in India should abandon the lockdown and refocus on its testing policy. Now, um, there are multiple schools of thought here, but I, I want to make this into a broader question, not just about COVID-19, mm -hmm. but about health, an area that you are familiar with and you've recently been writing on. Um, what are the health fallouts? We are not discussing that at all. Uh, the health system has been put in disarray. And, uh, um, you know, this, oops, uh, I mean, while we are, oh, it's clear that our health system is not prepared to address an, uh, a pandemic of this nature, what is also becoming clear is that we are so under-resourced that our, the diseases that we were fighting earlier have been completely put onto the wayside. W what are your thoughts on that? What should, uh, w what is your experience from the ground and what do you think we should be doing? Okay, so first of all, I think we certainly need more focus today on public health measures, uh, partly to avoid the need to reimpose local lockdowns because the lockdowns are so destructive. So we must try to avoid them at all costs. Uh, just to give you an example, here in Jharkhand, outside Ranchi, I don't see, I hardly see anyone wearing, wearing a mask or keeping distance or using sanitizer. So people have kind of, given up on the elementary precautions, maybe because they are tired or maybe because they're because they reconciled to the virus. I think that's really very unfortunate because wearing a mask is a cheap, uh, non-invasive, uh, uh, constructive and effective way of uh, reducing the risk of the virus, unlike a lockdown. And when I go to Chhattisgarh, the next state, the neighboring state, I see that most people uh, perhaps it's compulsory. I don't like the idea of compulsory masks so much, but I much prefer the idea of a compulsory mask to the idea of a compulsory lockdown. So I think we must uh, focus more on public health measures. And uh, on the question of health preparedness, I want to explain something I said earlier, which may not have been obvious. I said that the uh, states with a better health system have coped, coped better with the crisis. That may not be obvious, but let me explain what I mean. Uh, during the lockdown and to, a, to some extent even today, there was a massive disruption of routine health services in India. Uh, this is evident now. It has been known for some time, but it is particularly clear now from official data from the health management information system. Uh, 
I've been looking at some of this data with a colleague, uh, Vipul Pekra. And uh, one thing that's very clear is that there was a massive decline in the uh, health services across the country during that period. 20% uh, decline for institu institutional deliveries, 30% decline for child immunization, 40% decline for TB treatment, and 50% decline for outpatient attendance at healthcare centers. Uh, this has already been observed by others, including uh, Rukmini S, for example, who wrote about it in India Spend. But what has not been noticed is that the decline has been very uneven between different states. Some of the better organized states with more commitment to healthcare, for example, uh, Kerala, of course, uh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, Tamil Nadu, and even Orissa, for that matter, and to some extent, Chhattisgarh, uh, they managed to continue running the routine health services pretty much at normal levels throughout the lockdown. Whereas states like Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, and uh, Bihar allowed these services to collapse to you know maybe 20% of the normal levels, including uh, essential services like child immunization and even institutional deliveries. Now, of course, those are also the poorer states, but then Orissa is also poor, Chhattisgarh is also poor. So we can see clearly that there was, a, there was an avoidable uh, decline in health services, more than a decline, a collapse of routine health services in many states, which could have been avoided if there had been more attention to this and to the consequence of, you know, taking into account what you're doing, the effects that it's going to have for going to pay a price for this uh, decline of health services and one of the things that must be done today aside from the general public health measures and making it possible for the economy to reopen is to re reactivate all the essential services not just health but all the essential services that have been discontinued uh, in many cases excessively so I think uh, during the lockdown. So I think, uh, uh, Jean, we lost you for a little bit, but I'll just quickly rephrase what I'm you were sorry. saying. I know that's all right. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about a complete collapse in some states uh, of health services and how that is going to have a long-term impact and it was avoidable and how uh, uh, we can learn from the experiences in other states uh, on how this should have been avoided because uh, I think one of the things we have to recognize is COVID-19 is not a short-term game, it's a long-term game. We know the WHO keeps reminding us that we are it's here for at least two years. And um, if our health services continue to remain in disarray, mm -hmm. what it will do to our population health is something anybody can guess. Uh, we are completely out of town uh, time. I have, uh, I, I have just three minutes, so I'm going to ask you the last question that I did want to ask you. We've now traversed a whole series of issues. But one of the things that I'm most concerned about is that our poor uh, the most vulnerable, both health, education, nutrition-wise, uh, are coming back to seek employment in our cities all over again. Uh, the migrant workers are slowly trickling back because, like you rightly said, there's nothing for them to do uh, very often in the city, uh, in the in the villages that they have gone back to. What should we be doing? I mean, all of this has happened. What should we be doing now, as the state? as a society which is ethical and which they need from us. Because uh, we cannot undo the past, but there is enough that you have said today that we can learn from. So what should be two or three things that we urgently need to do, actionable things, as our large informal economy starts limping back to life and uh, many of our migrant workers are coming back to our cities? Okay, I guess you want a short response a lot of time. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with this vocabulary of we. What should we do? Because, you know, I think we I mean, in this I'm, case means mainly the government. And I, no, no, I, I don't mean, I, I don't mean I we are that's fine. the state. Right, so we have to distinguish who is doing what because there are different actors. Yeah. And we are not... I, Thing that uh, this year by uh, taking better care of migrant workers. <laughs>
And that would require to start with some kind of registration system so that we know where they are and what they're doing and so on and what the, what the situation. And there is supposed to be a system for that, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But many workers apparently, and maybe also the contractors who take them to various places, are very reluctant to get registered because firstly, they don't see the point, And secondly, they're afraid of being controlled. So I think we should give them a stake in being registered by associating that with some real benefits, you know, like uh, maybe accident, accident insurance or death insurance or various forms of assistance in, in distress uh, and a guarantee that what happened this year is not going to happen again. I think that would help uh, to uh, speed up this registration process and then building on that, you could try to arrange various kinds of benefits and uh, uh, rights for many of them. And the other thing I think we can do is uh, some sort of extension of the principle of employment guarantee to urban areas. Uh, that is being discussed quite a lot at the moment, as you probably, probably know. Uh, there's an interesting proposal for an urban ga employment guarantee act from the Azim University. And there's an experience already in Kerala for the last 10 years of an urban employment guarantee scheme. And I have also floated one possible idea uh, called DUET, the uh, Decentralized Urban Employment and Training Scheme, which would be a way of enabling a large number of decentralized public institutions to uh, hire labor at short notice at the expense of the government to do things like maintenance work and other things that are required at this time. So I think there are things on, that can be done and that would uh, help uh, the urban workers. Uh, at the end of the day, of course, we have to remember that the problem of urban unemployment and low wages in urban areas is to a large extent uh, uh, a reflection of the excess supply of labor in the rural areas so that people go to the cities in the hope of finding something there. Um, so we also have to think more about what we can do in the rural areas. Uh, and in a place like Jharkhand, for example, you know, there are all kinds of local resources that could be used in a sustainable and people-friendly manner to enable them to live better. I mean, there's all kinds of things, uh, there's pisciculture, horticulture, uh, livestock, all kinds of forest products and so on. And uh, if we put in place the institutional structures necessary to build up these resources for the benefit of local people, I think they could live a lot better than they are now. I mean, Jharkhand could be as prosperous as any other state based on a much more equitable uh, model than the present model of selling off the, the mineral resources of the states uh, for the benefit of companies or of the central government without them benefiting the local people. So I think these are some of the things uh, that we can do. Uh, the main thing is not a shortage of idea, but a political change that, gives, that makes it possible for policy making to give more attention to the rights and needs and interests of underprivileged people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jean, for joining us. Uh, we've completely run out of time, so my producer is going to mute us any minute. So I'm going to say thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Ron. Bye. Thank you.